Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. I appreciate you being here to lead us today. Y'all can have a seat. Good to have you here. Welcome to Lifeline Church. It's so good to have you here. Um, my name is Matt. I'm the new pastor here at Lifeline Church. So excited to be here. Thank you um, to all of you who serve and have make this transition so smooth. And Larry, to lift heavy things to get them on stage for us. Appreciate you, Larry. <laughs> uh, folks, I, I just want to say thanks again for being here. I, at this time, I want to invite Coit to come join me up on stage again. This is uh, my friend Coit, and um, Coit is going to be helping in a lot of different ways at Lifeline Church, and I just want to give you a formal introduction to what Coit's going to be doing. So, Coit, can you tell us a little bit about what your role will be here at Lifeline? Yeah. And so we'll have some really great opportunities for the next generation to have a home here at Lifeline, but also for ministry to men to, ha to happen on a regular basis. Yeah, if you can do both, right? What we said about is we want to build in the next generation. We've got to empower the men in the church to be there. Yes. Exactly. And so we'll, we're looking forward in the coming months to begin to cultivate a culture where youth can feel at home here and be ministered to. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll, we'll talk a little bit and just a, a little bit about what we have going on for some men, men's ministry here shortly. Yep. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and you want to share a little bit about what yeah, you're thinking about that? So yep. August 13th, which is a Saturday. Okay. Yeah, and what I think, one of the great things about doing events like this, I know that the ladies just had an, a coffee thing yesterday, right? That, who, yeah, so, yeah there's, the coffee was good, the, the, the conversation was better, is that right? Yeah, I hope so. Uh, so one of, the, one of the great things about um, having these opportunities to socialize and get to know each other is, one, it creates community within our church, but secondly, it creates uh, an on-ramp for those people who are, maybe aren't used to going to church. Maybe there's people who aren't used to um, being in a Christian context or asking questions in a, a, about Christianity or the Bible. And so it creates a nice pathway for people to connect. And so this is a, an opportunity, not just for the people who are in this room, but people who are in our community that might want to come and hang out with a bunch of guys and, yeah, and have community that way. Right. Throw axes. You should come. It'll be a great time. Yeah. What are you throwing axes at? I mean, you know, maybe that person depends on how it goes. Uh, oh, I hope yeah. not. <laughs> I hope not. No, yeah. <laughs> Larry's in. Uh, so axe throwing or something yeah. si similar to the activity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Something manly. Yep. Yeah. Not. Not coffee. To the, yeah. No. No. Uh, <laughs> coffee might be. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Monster energy drink. There you go. Because that's apparently what men drink. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, irrelevant. So my, my point being, um, so we're going to talk a little bit more of that in the coming weeks, give it a little bit more details as that gets fleshed out. But in the meantime, all you need to do is come talk to Coit yeah. about... If you've got an awesome idea for ministry. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Let's get Coit. it. It's going. We, Coit's been doing this for like five days, and so he's yeah. already made tons of progress. <laughs> it's, been, it's been great. Uh, secondarily, so you should be in proximity to a connection card and a pen. And so I'd like to ask you to, so we're, we're new here and we're still meeting you folks, but also we're creating, um, an, a church, yeah, a church management system with a database that kind of just makes sure all of our information is accurate up to date, that the people that are coming to Lifeline haven't moved three times and have changed phone numbers. And so we just want to make sure that we have the best information for all of you. And so what I'd like to ask you to do is just take a moment right, right now. It's, I don't care if you're distracted. I don't even care if you're on your phones. Uh, it does, not, not a big deal. No, it's okay. They're going to they read the Bible on their phones, Quite. Uh, yeah. So, illuminated. yeah, it's the illuminated gospel. <laughs> so uh, if you want to take a second just to uh, pull up your card and put your contact information down there and any other details that are relevant. Selena, you have some extra pens here if you need one. She can deliver those to you. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Quite. 
you can help me out in collecting these. I think Allison and Coit are going to collect these from you guys as you fill these out. And, uh, and we will get you set up in our system, and we'll have the c- a correct information for all of our lifeliners. Uh, while they do that, I just want to bring your attention to one more thing. I don't know if you noticed when you walked in. We've rearranged a little bit in here just to create a little bit more space for hospitality. And so um, our team kind of rearranged this hospitality center in this front room. So we have some donuts and snacks, and we have uh, some seating in there, some coffee. Uh, hopefully we're, we're planning in the next couple weeks to kind of get some visual aesthetics in there with some pictures, maybe feature some of our missionaries, and it can just be kind of like a welcome space. Uh, I'd love to have like a concierge area in there so we can have some experts of all things Lifeline, all the activities coming up, all the ministries going on, and so you can always, if you have a question or if you have somebody that you're bringing that's new, you can take them into that little concierge hospitality center, and they can answer all the questions and feel like they can be connected to everything that's going on at Lifeline. Thanks, guys. Uh, so as we get started here, I got, let me get my gear here. Uh, This is day one, and I've been looking forward to this. Been looking forward to being here with y'all. So I want to talk about an idea that I don't think I've really heard talked a whole lot in in Scripture, and that's, or not Scripture, but in sermons, but, and that is this idea of uh, what would Jesus would consider to be profanity in his own culture. And so there's, there's certain things that in Christian culture we would say is like our no-nos, you don't say those things. But Jesus uh, would never say these words that I'm about to say to you. That's not my job. Jesus would never say these words. But yet these are words that are common in our culture. But I would think that it would be something that would be so contrary to the culture and the value set of Jesus that if anybody were to come into his proximity and say— that's not my job. Jesus would be like, well, what is your job if not to serve one another in love? And he would confront that immediately. And so I want to talk about this idea and look at how Jesus has arrived at this, this value set uh, and how we as a people in our culture and a people in our families, people in our, and even in our churches, would get to this idea that this is okay to say, that's not my job. There's three reasons that I, I've thought of that why we would come to this conclusion of why we would say that's not my job. The first one is that we don't feel qualified to do it. So we would say something like, that's above my pay grade, not my job, not going to think about it, don't care. The second reason is that we would, we would suggest that it's not fair, that's uneven work. That's not my job to do that, it's your job to do it because we have to make sure that everything is done in, in fairness and equality. And then the third thing that we might say, it's not my job, is that we feel like we're owed something. We would say something like, I've done my part, so now it's your job to do your part. And so it's this transactional exchange. But Jesus opposes the, this, that's my, not my job attitude, and he's got his own reasons on why. One is because he knew that he was qualified. He knew that he had every capability to do any job. He would, didn't doubt himself, and he didn't sell himself short. The second thing is that he decided what was fair. He, it was up to him. He didn't let the world tell him what was fair. He didn't let the culture tell him what was fair. He didn't let some other person tell him what was fair. He said, I know it's fair because I'm going to decide what's fair, and therefore I'm not going to hold it against you. And the third thing is that he decided that his service was a gift and not a transaction. And so if, if his gesture of, of service was in response to something or to receive something, then it wouldn't have been out of love, it wouldn't have been out of honor, but rather he did it because his gift, his service was treated as a gift and not a transaction. So this first sermon series that we're doing, I've called Top 7, and what we're doing here is we're going to walk through seven passages of scripture that have deeply impacted my life and have shaped me, and hope that as you are walking through this, that you can consider passages of Scripture that have deeply impacted and shaped you. You can pick your own top seven. Uh, Maybe maybe you'll resonate with some of mine. Maybe you'll have a completely different set of seven. And maybe you are just now learning how to read the Bible and you've never really explored Scripture and you haven't really found any of the seven. Maybe you have one or two. But this is an opportunity to prompt you to look at what passages of Scripture God has worked through to impact and shape your life. And so this first one, I believe, has been especially transformative in my life. And it's a story of, of that Jesus that flies in the face of it's, it's, that's not my job. 
This has affected me deeply, and that's in John chapter 13. We're going to look at the first five verses in John chapter 13. If you want to read with me, you can read um, up on the screen. We have it up on the screen right here, or you can read along with where you are in your own devices. I'm reading from the NLT. I like the NLT, and this is what we're, we're covering today. So, John chapter 13, starting in verse 1, it says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that the hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. So it was time for the supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had given him all authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to Jesus. Now check this out, verse 4. This, is, this is, gets interesting. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Did you catch this? Verse 3 says, he knew all authority had been given to him. Therefore, he got down and started washing his disciples' feet. Now, we can read through this and see like, oh, see, that just seems like a logical way Jesus did things. But you have to understand that in this culture and context, if someone was given authority, the very last thing that they would ever do was touch somebody's nasty, icky feet. So just a little bit of context here. Have you, I want you to think about a time where you have washed somebody else's feet. Someone's clean, showered daily feet in your normal life. Is that a normal thing for people to do in our culture? It's, it's probably not typical. Most of you have probably not washed somebody else's clean feet. But in this culture, when they walk around in sandals and dust and have fungus and all kinds of nappy stuff all over their feet, no one wanted this job. It was especially gross. In fact, the lowest peasant would, been, would have been like an indentured servant would have been responsible for doing this. But in this context, when Jesus is, has all his disciples here, and there's, it's, it's a private event. There's, it's not a public thing where there's um, servants running around cleaning up after people. It would have been one person's responsibility to volunteer for this job, the person who thought that they were the least in the room. So this is Jesus' last moments with his disciples having all together. It's his last meal with them. He knows what's going to happen. He's going to be given over to his enemies who are going to try him unfairly and persecute him and eventually execute him. He knows what's going on. His disciples don't yet, but this is, the, this, this is his last lesson. He gets them together, and he's, he's saying, if there's one last final thing that I want you to get, it's this idea that you should never put any job below yourself. Never put yourself uh, in a position where you, you would think that you're superior to the job at hand. So, when our culture tells us that greater authority means less service, when you think about this, greater authority, we attribute that to mean less service, Jesus demonstrates that greater authority actually means greater service. It's the op actually the opposite in, this, in the spiritual kingdom of God, that as we increase in spiritual authority, that we also increase in spiritual service. That's so contrary to the way that things are. We think that now that I'm in a position of authority, I can delegate more and I can sit back and point fingers and, and watch other people do the work. That's, at least that's how we're treated. You might have been in a situation where you're treated that way. But Jesus is saying we actually get to volunteer for the greater responsibility when we're in a position of greater responsibility. And it's backwards to what's normal to us. So let's, let's pause for clarity for a second here. Because... Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, and if we're not careful, what we can do is we can think that Jesus was especially concerned with clean feet. That we can b think that the job is the most important thing, that there's a, there's a job that needs to be done, I'm just going to roll up my sleeves and go get the job done. But the truth is that Jesus isn't concerning himself with the job, he's concerning himself with the person. He recognizes that what he is, the gesture that he is doing to lay down his his rights as a person of authority in the room, is that he's not saying this job is of highest importance, so important that I'm going to take it upon myself to get it done. What he's saying is you are of highest importance, and so I'm willing to do whatever it takes to honor you. Jesus is always more concerned about the person than he is the job. So the way I think about this practically is something that when I talk about this, everyone rolls their eyes. Because it's too personal. It's something very personal that all of us have to deal with on a daily basis. 
that no one wants to really admit how important it is. And that is whose responsibility it is to do the dishes. Because everybody just did the dishes. And somehow there's always dirty dishes. And they're never the person who has to clean them. They're not my dishes. I just did the dishes. This is how it always is. And somehow there's always, unless you're using paper plates, there's always need to do more dishes. And I will tell you that there's three reasons why a person will do the dishes. Three reasons. Okay? I've thought deeply about this profound truth. Okay? The first reason is because you prefer the dishes to be done. You prefer the, the sink to be clean. And so you might say something like, they can do it all they want. I just need it to be clean. So I'm going to do the dishes. I don't care if it's my turn or their turn or if it's my dishes or their dishes. I just want the dishes to be clean. So I'm going to do the dishes. So you prefer them to be clean. Therefore, you do them regardless of whether or not it's your job to do them or not. The second one is because it's your turn because they just said, I did the dishes last night. You did the dishes. Or in your family, they might say, I cook you clean. Have you, so any, anybody in this room have that arrangement? So if somebody does, they're like making eye contact. So the idea is that, um, so I did my share, so therefore it's your responsibility to do your share. So first two, I prefer them to be clean. Second is, it's your turn to do them. And the third thing is the most um, commonly missed of the, thir the, of the three, and that is to honor the person whom you're serving. When I, when I do the dishes, I have to decide, I think they're all true at some point. Sometimes I just prefer to have a clean kitchen. Sometimes I know that Allison has done the dishes for the last six days, and I, I should probably step up. But sometimes I think, man, they are just destroying this place, and they're never going to keep up with this. There's so much going on. My kids are, are just not going to clean them up for this, um, themselves, or my wife has been, she's in the weeds with all the stuff going on. So I'm just going to do it and not say anything and let them know that it's a secret expression of love that I want to honor them. And we can do that. And so this is something super tangible, doing dishes, but we can apply this in every aspect of our life, that we can have those three different motivations. I want to do it because I prefer it a certain way. I'm going to do it because it's my turn to do it, or I'm going to do it not because I deserve it or because it's my responsibility, but because I want to value the people that I'm serving. And so it's a completely different motivation. And this third motivation is the motivation that Jesus is taking when he washes his disciples' feet. He's not doing it because I just preferred clean feet at dinner. He's not saying it, well, you know, James did it last time, and, you know, John did it the time before that, and Peter did it before that, so I guess I'm up. Jesus didn't say that. He just took the responsibility without saying anything. He said, all authority has been given to me. This is not my job, but I'm going to do it because I love them. I value them. So he takes off his robe, he bends down in the position of humility, the position of a servant, and he honors those who probably should be serving him, who don't deserve what he's doing for them. So when we volunteer for whatever dirty feet job that we're talking about, what we're doing is we are demonstrating value to the people that we're serving. And by serving, Jesus was saying, you're worth this dirty job. What comes to mind when I think of this is uh, Hunger Games, when... The, the gal, uh, Katniss, says, I volunteer as tribute. So there's, the, it plays out really well because the, the government is saying, hey, um, we want somebody who really loves the opportunity to serve and, and stand for what we believe in. So the idea, I, I volunteered as a place of honor. But what she's saying is, I love my sister so much that I would rather lay myself down in her place so that she doesn't have to. I think she borrowed that from Jesus. I think that's where she got that from, because it's in the Bible first, and that's where all popular media comes from, is it just borrows from truth and scripture. Let me tell you an example where I think the humanity gets this well, because I think we could just harp on all the ways that we don't get it right, but let's talk about for a second of where we get this well. When I think about examples of when humanity gets this principle of, of sacrificial service, servant leadership, when, I, when they get it well, I think of parenthood. We get it well. It's like a natural thing. Because when you have a child, suddenly you do diapers, and you do laundry, and you take, give baths every day, sometimes three times a day to your children. You deal with blood, vomit. There's this engineering contraption that is meant to drive people mad. They're called car seats. If you've ever tried to install these things in your car, and then you have to upgrade them like six times before your child outgrows car seats, and they're all configured differently. 
No one volunteers for this job because they enjoy it. No one prefers this life of dealing with, and then they vomit in the car seat, and there's all kinds of nasty stuff. And this, as a parent, you say, you know what? I don't love this job, but I love the person, so I'm going to do what I need to do to honor them. So we get it right here. It's a natural thing of, I love this person so much that I'm going to lay down my preferences and my desires, and I'm going to serve this, this person. For those of you who don't have children, I want you to consider like a, a sibling or a close friend or somebody you care deeply about, and think about a time where you've heard this question and how you've responded to it. Will you help me move? No one says, I love helping people move, especially in August. No one has ever said such things. But we do it because we care about the person. We go and get the U-Haul truck, and we move the piano down the stairs, and we break down the desk that's way too big for the apartment. And we work together, and we spend eight hours sweating, and they buy us a Whataburger. Like, it's, it's, there's not, we're not getting compensated for this. We're doing it because we care about them and because we love them. And so in the same way, even you don't have to have kids to understand this principle because there's instances in life where we take care of each other sacrificially, not because we prefer to, not because they helped us move last time, but because we care about them enough and want to show value to say yes to meet their need. Oh, all right. So, Servant leadership is at the very least a loose concept for us because we have these examples. Because we have parenthood, because we have friendship, because we have family. Jesus mastered it, though, for our sake. He gave up everything so that we could have everything, which is an impossibly dirty job. And he does it because he values us. So there's a, there's a common misconception that I want to address here just for a second. And that is this thing that I hear all the time, and that is, well, Jesus can do that because he's Jesus. I can't do that because I'm not Jesus. If I were Jesus, then I could do that. I'm just going to do the best I can to be like him. But in the end, he's Jesus and I'm not, and therefore I can't get there. But actually, that's the opposite of what Jesus has hoped for us in this passage. I know that because it's in the Bible. Let's read it. John 13. Let's scroll down a little bit. Verse 12. He says, After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked. He's going to teach them what he just did. This is... This is the way to do it. He says, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. He's saying, you didn't miss what I, I, I have the authority that you think I have. You didn't mis misunderstand who I am. Verse 14, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. So Jesus, in doing all this, his whole point was to say, you can do it too. You can be like me. I will exemplify, if, if there's anybody who has authority, who's anybody who has reason to not stoop so low and do a dirty job, it's me. And so since I can do it, now therefore I invite you to do the same one to another. And so it's not a thing of, like, well, Jesus can do the dirty job because he's Jesus. Jesus can do things sacrificially and selflessly because he's Jesus. Well, I'm never going to be able to do it like that. Well, the, the whole point of him doing that was to show us that we can do it too. So he's saying, I hope for you to do all as I've done for you, because I have done it for you, you can too. Which is incredibly empowering. It gives us the ability to do things that we wouldn't be able to do on our, on our own. So he makes a way for it. So why then is it so important for God's people? Why then is it so important for God's people to understand this? Well, I'm going to tell you the wrong reason on why we serve one another. And that is because we are motivated by debt. Because we owe it to owe it to Jesus. Sometimes we'll say, well, Jesus has done so much for me, and I owe him everything. Therefore, I have to lay down my responsibilities in my life to pay him back, because there's nothing that I could do that it could ever respond for what he has done for me. That is the opposite of what grace is, folks. That is the very opposite of what he was trying to come to challenge us with. He's, he was coming to give it to us, to say, this is what this is what I have for you because you're worth it, because I love you, because I want to bring transformation into your life, and I want you to do the same because, because I love the people that you're serving too. But yeah, often we get it flipped in our head, and we think, well, Jesus has done so much for me, therefore I have to do things back for him to, to satisfy the debt that he has done for me. He came to undo a debt, not create a debt. And so therefore we have to embrace the freedom that comes with Jesus' sacrificial gestures of leadership to us so that we can do it one to another. 
Okay, so we're getting this. The right reason is this. We have been changed by his service. And once we are changed by his service, once we receive his generosity, it should, it should affect us. It should bring transformation. It should realign us. It should reposition our minds and our hearts to think and to value as Jesus does. So what then do we learn from Jesus in this story? So if you're going to write something down, this is what I want you to write down. A servant leader assumes the burden. A servant leader assumes the burden. Now, this is, this is maybe uncommon phrasing that we don't hear often. Assume the burden. What we're saying is a servant leader pursues a need, and then he seeks it out and then meets that need so that somebody else doesn't have to bear it. If you think about a burden that is carried like it's a heavy weight, maybe it's a, a physical weight, maybe it's something um, emotional, maybe it's something relational, but to assume the burden means that we would seek out that need and we would embrace it and take it upon ourselves so somebody else doesn't have to. So a servant leader assumes the burden. And we, he's, a servant leader assumes the burden not because we value the need, but because we value the person. And by serving, we're saying you're worth it. Let me share for just a moment how Jesus affected me with this passage of Scripture, with this story. When I discovered this truth, I found freedom from performance, from earning people's approval. I think this is something that our flesh um, really prompts us to think, is that we have to prove ourselves, that we have to perform, that we have to determine our worth, we have to uh, establish credibility. But understanding, when you really meditate on this passage, as I, as I sorted through it, I realized that my performance is irrelevant that Jesus didn't require his disciples to perform or to accomplish or to do anything in order for them to be worthy of his gener generous service. And so in the same way, I receive freedom from performance, from earning his approval, and I'm free to take joy in valuing others more than myself. You, you realize that's, that's how the, the world works, is that we think about ourself first and then others second. And the more that we're consumed with ourself, the less that we are capable of looking at the needs of others. But Jesus had mastered this principle so much that he was able to yield his own desires and his own needs and elevate those of those around us. And so therefore, when I read this passage of scripture, when I, when I let it affect me, I realized that it wasn't about, it wasn't about what my worth was and my credibility and my validity, but what Jesus saw in me. And that's what brought transformation in my life. And therefore, I was able to live my life differently, freed to take joy in valuing others more than myself. So why is this Jesus' final teaching lesson for his disciples? Well, Jesus' hope was for entire churches to live this way. I think our, we recoil sometimes when we look at this because we think— well, it's not my job. If I, if it's, I, I have that attitude that I'm just going to get taken advantage of, and people are going to abuse me, and no one else is going to do their share of the, of the call, of the responsibility. But Jesus' hope was for entire churches to live this way. His hope was not that a few would meet the needs of many, but that the many would meet the needs of every. So that every need would be met, every need would be seen, every need would be felt, and that the church, the people of God, would see those things, seek them out, and meet them before they're even requested. And when we think about this, we think uh, in multiple layers of this. We think practically that there's big needs. That there's financial needs, that there's medical needs, that there's provisional needs. But most needs that people have aren't, hey, I'm going to get evicted from my house, or I have to go into surgery. Those, those happen, but not every day. Most needs are quiet needs. They're relational needs. They're needs for encouragement. They're needs for practical instruction. Hey, I see that you're really struggling to get your life in order, that you're, you're feeling stressed all the time. Let me, let me address that. Let me help you walk through that. Let's get together and we can talk through that. A need for affection. There's so many different relational or personal or practical needs that we can meet, that we can see that other people in our life don't even realize that they have an unmet need, and we can come alongside and help them. You know, when Jesus washes his disciples' feet, it's nothing that 
is it's not going to change the trajectory of their future. It's going to change the trajectory of their evening because they're going to be able to share together in cleanliness and enjoy the, the, their dinner without the stench of dirty feet. But yet the gesture of it says everything about what Jesus stands for. So this is my challenge for you. As you read through this passage, and maybe you want to revisit it, find someone's burden and assume it. Find it. So what I'm saying is, if you're, if you're transformed by Jesus, then it becomes our burden to find the burden to find the, of somebody else's and assume it. So take it on and say, I'm going to do this for you, even though you don't even know that you need it to be met. Even though you didn't ask me to do it, even though you don't deserve for me to do it, even though it's not my turn to do it, I'm going to assume it. So we seek it out. It's our responsibility. I'm not going to wait for Larry to come to me and say, hey, I have this need. Can you meet it? I'm going to be attentive enough and sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit to know what the need is and to meet him where he is so that that need can be met. And maybe it's a need that he didn't even realize was the root of something in his life. And this is how the Holy Spirit works to bring transformation to communities. So think of it as a volunteer's tribute. And I think what we need to do is, if we're, if we're genuine about this, and we want to be able to embrace this reality that Jesus is trying to communicate regarding student uh, servant leadership, then what we have to do is we have to pray and say, Lord, would you reveal to me those in my life who have a burden that is unmet? And I'll tell you what, if you pray that prayer, it won't take long before the Lord drops something in your mind and says, hey, you know so-and-so, there's a need there, and you know what, you see it, and you know what you have to do. And it's probably not going to be give them $5,000, or, you know, it, it's probably not going to be something absurd. It's probably going to be like, hey, send them a text message and say these words, because it's what they need to hear right now. Or, hey, maybe you should invite them over for dinner, or it's something very approachable, because Jesus doesn't only work in, in earth-shattering interjections in our life. He interacts personally as well. And so the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what it is. And when you feel the urge to say, well, it's their turn. It's not my job. I just did that. I don't really care that much. Maybe that's what it, the moment where you say, what does it look like to assume the burden in this situation? What does it look like to be a representation of servant leadership in this situation? And as you do this, what you're going to do is you're going to add value to the lives in which those you serve, and you are going to align your own attitude with Christ's. And that really is the goal. It's not to do what Christ expects of us, but it's to share in the things that are, he's most passionate about, that he loves, so that we would share in those things too. So let me pray this over you today, and let us be transformed by this passage of Scripture. I hope that it at least prompts you to go and search for what scripture in your own ex exploration of truth that God has revealed to you and brought meaning to your life. Lord, we thank you for you, Jesus, for the example that you set. And you washed your disciples' feet and you said you can do this too. I thank you that you are one who assumes the burden. This is just a simple example of what that looks like. I thank you for the people in our life that you are going to meet their burdens through us and those around us, that we'll be cared for, that we'll be uh, valued and received with grace and worthiness, not because of what we can do, not because of what we've achieved, not because of what we can pay back. There's no debt, but God, but you, what you want to do in us and through us, Lord. God, bless them, and may your spirit speak clearly to them. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, may you be blessed. May God's favor be upon you. May he give you success in everything that you do. And let's go take the truth of Scripture to our community this week. Amen.